but we're really excited about uh, Professor Loris Yaris' uh, lecture this evening. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, a lot of us, it's been a difficult few days um, given the hostage uh, tragedy at the um, synagogue in Texas on Saturday and then the close relationships in terms of uh, Rabbi Charlie having grown up in Congregation Shari Tzedek here in East Lansing and his mom being a member. So I know so many of you, um, it's been an even more challenging week. So our thoughts are with you. Uh, and um, and uh, we also will have a forum this Friday uh, for um, people to share how they're feeling, their thoughts. Um, uh, it will be Friday at 11.30. It'll be over Zoom. Uh, we'll put it, um, Ariana will put it in the chat and everyone's invited. It's particularly for um, faculty students and, and uh, staff at MSU, but also um, alumni and community members are also welcome to join in if you'd like. Um, and we're opening it up to the entire MSU community and we've gotten Kind of acknowledgments um, from different colleges of this and support um, from different quarters of MSU and so um, we're really appreciative of that so um, again you're welcome to join us in the chat now I also wanted to alert you to that um, we're our next event just so you have it um, for those of you who may not have our newsletters on January 26 um, and it's on the new book the book smugglers and so Ariana will put that in the chat as well um, it should be a really interesting event. And um, before I introduce uh, Professor Yaris, some of you may have heard her before um, previously um, speaking, but um, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors. So um, they include the College of Arts and Letters, the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, James Madison College, the College of Social Science, the Office of uh, Intercultural uh, Affairs, and the Department of Religious Studies. Um, so we're really grateful uh, for them helping to advertise and support um, uh, Professor Yaris's lecture for this evening. Um, for those of you who have not heard her, it's a real, real privilege um, to hear her amazing um, analysis and extremely innovative and creative work. Um, she's also a very popular professor who teaches, among other things, um, Judaism and Jewish identity. Um, so she's an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Michigan State University, also a core um, faculty of the Serling Institute. And her work focuses on Jewish as education as a site for understanding the vice diverse contours of Judaism and Jewish identity in the modern world. Her current research projects include a book on the Jewish Sunday School in 19th century America, and together with Professor Sharon Avni from CUNY, a contemporary ethnographic project exploring Jewish learning in cultural arts context. This latter project serves as the basis for tonight's talk. She's won grants for this research. I heard an earlier version of this talk, I think for the Center for Inter uh, Interdisciplinary Studies earlier, and it was just fascinating. So we're in for a real treat this evening and we'll have uh, room for discussion and Q&A. Um, when Laura's speaking, I think when she's using her PowerPoint, it may automatically be on speaker view, but then when we get to the discussion, you might wanna highlight um, speaker view so that you can see her in, in big, you know, bigger when she's talking because there's so many of us with small pictures. Um, and then when you have questions or wanna enter discussion, um, you can put it in the Q&A. You can actually put your hand up electronically since um, we can see you and then uh, we might be able to call on you as well. Um, so either way, um, thank you for being with us and we really, really looking forward to your lecture, uh, Professor Yaris, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yael, and thank you to the Serling Institute um, for initiating this talk. And thank you to you all for being here. I know at this point in the pandemic, many, many of you may be feeling a little zoomed out. So the fact that you chose to spend your Wednesday night here with us on Zoom is certainly not something that um, I take lightly. And so I'm really looking forward to being in conversation with everybody today. I'm gonna to take a moment just to, to share my screen. Um, so that you can see um, some things that I'm gonna, gonna share with you today. Bear with me just a second. All right, we should be all set up. Yeah. Okay. All right, so today I'm gonna be talking about the television show Stiesel, let's talk about, uh, the television show Stiesel, and the title of my talk is Stiesel, let's talk about it. And we're going to explain the resonance of that title um, later on. 
Now, some of you may be Stussel aficionados. Um, maybe you've seen all three, uh, three series of the show on Netflix. Others of you may be totally new and have yet to mm -hmm. bend your way through the through the series on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And that's that's I totally okay. behind the dog's ears. All right. Um, this is maybe a good opportunity just to remind everybody to, to mute until we get to our QA. Um, okay, so you don't have to have, have seen uh Stiesel to follow along with our talk this evening. Um, but for those of you who are not familiar, um, here is a short intro to the show. So Stiesel is an Israeli uh, television drama series um, about a fictional Haredi, that's ultra-Orthodox family, living in a neighborhood in Jerusalem. Now it was created by two Israeli filmmakers and one of them, Yonatan Indersky, he grew up Haredi in Jerusalem and so very much understands and knows this community firsthand. Now, the show focuses on one family, that's the, the titular Stiesel family, um, and you can see three of them, three of the main characters represented here on the screen. So in the middle there, we have Shulam, who is the patriarch of the family. He's recently widowed when the series begins. And uh, he lives with his 20-something son, Akiva, who is uh, on the left there on the screen. And Akiva is trying to make a career as an artist, which is somewhat unusual for a Haredi Jew. Um, and as the series develops, he is also in search of his Besheret, his significant other, the, um, the love of his life. And it's those two dynamics really that, um, that drive a lot of the plot of the, of the series. Uh, Akiva trying to fulfill his artistic yearnings um, and also find love. And um, much of the plot is driven by the fact that those yearnings often conflict with his father's expectations, as well as some of the strict norms of the Haredi world in which they live. Now, we also have Giti, who is there on the right hand side of the screen. Um, that's one of Shulam's other children. Um, and much of her story um, deals with her struggling to cope as her, her husband temporarily abandons um, her and her family. Now, the thing that I would like you to know about Stiesel, if you know nothing else, is that many of the primary themes of the show focus on dynamics that we might consider universal, right? Things that we might all be able to relate to, even if we ourselves are not Israeli, Haredi, or, or even Jewish, right? So those are themes like the pursuit of love, the bonds of family, and the relationship between the living and the dead. But despite this universalism, the show also adheres pretty carefully to Haredi culture and customs. So its dialogue, for example, is presented not only in Hebrew, but also in Yiddish, which is the, the spoken language of most ultra-Orthodox communities. And since airing in Israel in 2013, the series has won numerous Israeli awards, awards for best drama, best director, best screenplay and, and best actor. So it's, it's really has been, been a real hit. Now, Stiesel isn't the first depiction of ultra-Orthodox Jews on the small or the big screen. In fact, there seems to be something of an enduring interest in shows and movies that claim to lift the lid on aspects of life in these rather closed and insular communities. So I might even go so far as to, as to suggest that there's a discernible sort of voyeuristic urge right, on, the, on the part of viewers when it comes to this massive interest in shows about isolated and, and pretty self-sufficient communities. It's an urge that has us wanting to learn more about these communities and understand what goes on inside them. There's often no small degree of judgment in there too. We want to see inside these communities to see how restrictive they are and how closed their life is compared to our own perhaps more cosmopolitan realities. And this judgmental voyeurism might go some way to account for the fact that most depictions of ultra-Orthodox Judaism on the screen don't exactly paint a flattering portrait of life in these communities. 
So we might think of the series Merhak Nagia, which is uh, in the middle of the screen here, um, a touch away, which was a mini series that debuted in 2007. And it focused on an ultra orthodox teenage girl living in the Haredi city of B'nai Brak. And she scandalously falls in love with a secular Russian emigre. Now, the implicit message of that series is that romantic love can really only be attained by, by overcoming religion, right? If this girl wants to, to be able to be with the man of her dreams, she has to leave her religious community behind. We might also consider the movie Kadosh. There's a still from that on the left-hand side of the screen. And that movie depicts the unhappiness of, of Haredi marriages for women, right? From forced betrothals to um, the emphasis on producing children as um, demonstrative of a woman's worth and status. Or more recently, many of you may have seen Unorthodox. Um, there's a promo um, image from on the right hand side of the screen there. Um, it stars Shira Haas, who's a famed Israeli actress who is also in Shtisel. Um, and um, in that series, um, uh, Shira Haas, who plays the, the main character, she leaves behind an unhappy marriage um, in an ultra orthodox enclave in New York to pursue her artistic dreams in Germany. Now, in the context of this plethora of options for seeing ultra orthodox Jews on the screen, Stiesel offered something different. So in the words of one of its creators, Jonathan Indersky, that's the creator who, who grew up Haredi himself, he said, quote, this outlook that Haredim live in a kind of ghetto and are just waiting for the day they can escape, well, that's an occupation fantasy for secular people, right? According to Indersky, that, that narrative really doesn't depict the reality of Haredi life. So rather than tell a tale about the unhappiness of ultra-Orthodox life, or a tale about an enlightenment narrative, right, in which some kind of a free thinker, a, a square peg who doesn't quite fit the mold, um, manages to, to escape uh, the ultra-Orthodox community into which they were born. Well, Stiesel doesn't do any of that. It focuses on a family that is, is fully committed to this observant lifestyle. And it tells the story of their, of their somewhat quotidian struggles, really. Struggles to earn a living, uh, maintain families, and, and find romantic partners as well. Now, when Stiesel first came to the screens in 2013, it was aimed at an Israeli audience with little anticipation that it would garner such global appeal. It was a venture that was funded by Abi Chai, which is a uh, philanthropic foundation, has, has now shuttered, um, who invested in various cultural arts ventures in Israel to increase the visibility of religious Judaism and also to attempt to improve perceptions of religious Jews among their secular Israeli counterparts. Now, Abi Chai saw Stiesel as an opportunity for secular Jews to see Haredim as, as real people, like people who face similar struggles, similar challenges, and, and similar joys um, as, as they did. So Suri Drucker, who was director of film and television at Abi Chai, said in an interview, what she liked about the script for Stiesel was that, quote, we can all identify with these characters, no matter what our backgrounds are. They cross cultures. And that's what we must look for when we are approached with a script. A good story must portray Jewish life in an engaging, non-apologetic and humanly complex manner. So two organizations, um, Abi Chai and also the Gesho Multicultural Film Fund, originally invested at 90,000 uh, US dollars in producing the series, so not an insignificant budget. Um, but they had relatively little appeal that it would sell outside of Israel. But when Netflix picked it up, its audience became global. global. And it came to Netflix in 2018, um, so before the COVID-19 pandemic, and it became popular then, um, but especially during the global pandemic, right, when, as we know, people, particularly during those lockdown periods, were, were stuck in their homes and they were looking for shows to binge. Well, the show really ex achieved an explosive popularity at that point. Now, one of the things that we, we know we've discovered about television consumption during COVID-19 is that viewers have proven more willing to take a risk on shows that maybe expand their cultural palettes. 
And that might go some way towards explaining the somewhat unlikely popularity of a show like Stiesel, right? With again, no emancipatory narrative showing Orthodox Jews showing off the, throwing off the shackles of their oppressive religious life. Um, and again, with, with dialogue that was largely filmed in Yiddish, right? Which is a language that even most Jews are not all that familiar with these days. So Stiesel, um, when it was added to Netflix, became a huge cultural phenomenon. So perhaps if you are a Stiesel fan in the audience, you've taken the which Stiesel character are you quiz on social media. Or perhaps you have worn your love of the show on your sleeve, literally, by purchasing a character-themed t-shirt, um, which is here in the middle of the screen. I believe you can also get the same image emblazoned on a shower curtain. Um, I haven't done that personally, but you do you. Um, and in 2019, Temple Emmanuel, which is one of the largest synagogues in the New York metropolitan area, they hosted a panel discussion um, featuring two of the main characters of the show, Shulam and Giti. There's an advert um, for that discussion there on the right hand side of the screen. Now, it was originally planned as a one night event with 2,300 seats on offer. Well, the show sold out in four hours and they quickly added a second night that too sold out in just seven hours. And uh, outside of the building on the night of the first show, the line to get in took up an entire block um, on Fifth Avenue, continuing down at 65th and 66th streets as well. And if you are familiar with New York real estate, you will know that that is, that is a lot of real estate. And one of the organizers um, of the event admitted that he had never seen this level of interest and excitement for any program, um, even adding that when the synagogue had hosted an event with former President Obama, he said, quote, Obama was easier. Now, due to enormous uh, interest in the, in the show, um, a third and most likely final series was created in 2020, um, and this time with more of the global audience in mind. And that third and likely final series uh, began streaming on Netflix in April 2021. Now, for this talk tonight, I'm not going to dig into Stiesel as a, as a production, right? I'm not going to dig into the, the, the themes of the, of the show. And that isn't because there isn't a lot to say, there absolutely is. And since Stiesel came to the attention of, of US audiences, scholars and also journalists alike have, have paid a lot of attention to the show. They've analyzed its use of themes from classical and modern Jewish literature. Um, they've looked at its plot and its representation of, of Haredim. And there's certainly a lot to say about what Stiesel does and, and doesn't get right about its portrayal of that community and Jewish life in Israel more broadly. But my interest in Stiesel lies less in the dynamics of the show and its plot and more in how it was received by its audience. So this project is part of a broader study on learning and Judaism in cultural arts contexts, um, which I have the privilege of co-directing with my colleague, uh, Professor Sharon Avni, who is a linguist, linguistic anthropologist at CUNY. And it's a project that is uh, sponsored by Brandeis University's Mandel Center for the Study of Jewish Education. Now, as scholars with broad interests in Jewish education and Jewish learning, we're really interested in finding out what people learn from watching Stiesel. Now, I want to say at this point that we think of learning in a really maximal sense, right? So when we think of learning, we might think of, of the acquisition of new content knowledge, for example. That might be the first thing that, that comes to mind. Um, so, for example, that because of watching Stiesel, people learn that um, ultra-Orthodox Jews speak Yiddish as a spoken language um, and that men characteristically um, dress in black suits with, with white shirts. That would be an example of, of new content knowledge acquisition. But we also think that learning can take on an affective dimension. And here we take our cues particularly from a theorist of education called Jonas Frickman, um, who has written um, pretty extensively on the importance of, of affect and the arts. Now, according to Frickman, and here I'm reading from the quote on the screen, he says, when a person engages with a cultural arts product, such as a TV show, 
and they're prompted to recall a life experience or reflect on their sense of self or realize a connection with information learned in other contexts. When that happens, they experience moments of visceral reaction and reflective self-identification that attune and reify their personal connections and attachments. This might take the form of awakening nostalgia, forging discursive connections, or driving personal meaning making. But in all cases, an educational process have, has occurred. So here, Frickman is encouraging us to think of learning not only in terms of a one-to-one -one correspondence of, of new content acquisition, right, but also as occurring through the kind of emotive reactions that people might have um, through engaging with the cultural arts, such as watching television. Right? And those kinds of emotive reactions that might happen might include um, being prompted to tell stories right? by seeing something on the screen and remembering something about an experience that we've had in the past or a family member or a friend. Um, so also nostalgia, right? the ability of, of cultural arts to awaken nostalgia. Um, it also might prompt affective reactions like a, a gasp or a laugh, right? All things that, that make an impact on us, right? And that, that drive meaning making on the part of an individual as we sit in front of our TV screens. Now, I want to make very clear that by looking at viewer receptions of the TV show Stiesel through the prism of learning, isn't to say that we're automatically jumping on the bandwagon of, of Abi Chai, the foundation who sponsored Stiesel as something of a PR campaign for Haredi Judaism in Israel. Now for Abi Chai, indeed, um, Stiesel was an educational initiative, right? Um, oops, excuse me just a second. Um, it was an educational initiative, right? It was designed as an intervention on the Israeli religious landscape, right? To improve public perceptions of Israeli Jews. Now, in our research project, our agenda isn't to find data to prove Abihai's hypothesis, right, and confirm that public perceptions of ultra-Orthodox Jews or Jews or Israel, that any of those things improved as a result of Stiesel. It's just simply not our research question. What we actually want to do is to kind of disrupt this one-to-one -one correspondence of Abihai's assumption. Simply put, we think that it's probably too reductive to think of Stiesel as an input variable with an anticipated set of affective outputs, right, that ultimately yields the net result of more positive appraisal of ultra-Orthodox Jews and Judaism. Now, it might be helpful here to think about what people take away from watching television shows as um, not a sort of one-to-one -one, like input-output variable, but rather as a set of synthetic experiences. Now, this is a term that is used by scholars of political science, Jay Furman, Daniel, and Paul Musgrave, and which they define as the impressions, ideas, and pseudo-recollections about the world um, that is derived from exposure to media. And these synthetic experiences, they reinforce, they induce, and they even replace identities and beliefs that affect how audiences behave in the real world. In other words, um, what they're saying here is that people take what they see on television into their real lives, right? Even at time, even if at times this is this is unintentional. So when we consume media, they suggest, we build up these synthetic ideas, ideas about the people and the cultures that we see represented on the screen. And even if we don't realize it, these ideas do ultimately impact the way that we encounter real life instantiations of, of what we've seen. And those synthetic experiences can also be, can be complex and complicated. And it's that complexity that in this project we're interested uh, in exploring. So Daniel uh, and Musgrave argue that, that fiction and popular culture should definitely be taken seriously, right, as sources for how um, different cultures and particularly minority cultures, right, are, uh, are seen in the world today. Now, something else that we knew from the outset of this study was not only that we wanted to think about learning in this, this very maximal sense and understand the really diverse um, content knowledge and affective responses and synthetic knowledge that people take away when they watch television. But what we also knew is that people don't watch TV in isolation, right? So a show like Stiesel 
is watched by viewers who are also active on Facebook and other forms of social media. And they're likely to watch a show with phone in hand, right, ready to Google in search of new information. Now, as scholars working in the field of digital religion have, have really foregrounded, when we study examples of religion on the screen, what we really need to do is to understand how viewers of those shows are navigating relationships between the multiple spheres of their online and offline lives. And what we found in our study was that viewers didn't just encounter Stiesel through Netflix, they explored it in other online settings as well. So soon after we began looking at Stiesel for our cultural arts project, we learned about a popular Facebook group that had been set up for fans of the show. It was called Stiesel, Let's Talk About It. So that's the title of my talk this evening. And it was founded by three women, totally coincidentally, from metropolitan Detroit. It was founded in 2018. And it was, it was founded by these women as they, they had begun watching the show and they, they, they all wanted a venue to sort of share their thoughts and exchange articles about it with one another, right? They started with a text message exchange, but it, it wasn't so easy to share articles and images. So um, one of them said, you know what, I'm gonna create a Facebook group and then it will be really easy for us to chat together. Um, and in our interview with uh, one of the founders of the group, Mimi Markovsky, she told us that she created the group at 11 o'clock on a Thursday night. And by the following evening, the group had attracted 250 members. Today, it boasts over 33,000 members from, uh, uh, from, from countries across the world. Now, after speaking with Mimi about the, the Facebook group, we realized that it offered a really unique online ethnographic field site to investigate what people learned, uh, not only when they watch a show about a Jewish Haredi family, but also what they learned through interacting with others on social media. And as I said, members of the group um, don't just come from the United States, they, um, they come from, um, from overseas, from, from lots of different countries. Um, and the group includes Jews of every imaginable denominational identity uh, and none, um, as well as also lots of members who self-identified as, as Christian, as Hindu, as Muslim, Buddhist, um, and, and atheist and secular as well, right? So it was a real melting pot, is a real melting pot of identities, ideas, and knowledge. Now, we joined the group in, 20, uh, in 2020, and Mimi was kind enough to make us uh, moderators for the yeah. project of seeing behind the scenes. And in that role, we quickly discovered that posts were being contributed really every few minutes, and they garnered dozens, if not hundreds, uh, of comments. Now, some of these posts were, were pretty typical of social media fan sites, right? Um, expressing appreciation for the show, um, love of the characters, admiration for the actors, um, and, and sharing articles about it. But other posts went really deep into the world of Orthodox Judaism. And commentators uh, in this Facebook group would get into discussions of halakha, Jewish law, and, and minhag, Jewish custom, and then the differences between the two. Other posts were passing the linguistic variances of, of Yiddish and Hebrew, right, and, and showcasing the, the characteristic vocabulary deployed by characters in the show. And often in the course of these conversations, um, self-identifying Orthodox, even ultra-Orthodox uh, members of the group came in and offered themselves as authorities and, and shared their experience in living in Orthodox communities. So quickly, we, we saw the potential of the group as an ethnographic field site, and, and we began to, to scrape, that is, download and analyze our posts to it. We conducted a survey among its members, um, which garnered 268 responses, and we followed up by interviewing a representative sample of some of its members. And then we learned that a new series of the show would be available to stream on Netflix beginning in April 2021. And we began to look for a medium to capture the living room conversations of viewers as they streamed each new episode. Now, what we really wanted, right, following up from those uh, theoretical um, propositions of Jonas Frickman that we read about earlier, what we really wanted was a glimpse into viewers' immediate reactions, right, their responses to, to characters and stories and plotline. 
we really wanted to know what, what made them gasp, what made them point something out, uh, or what made them reach to reach for their phone maybe to Google for something unfamiliar. Now, a truly fly on the wall uh, method for this kind of ethnographic observation, uh, clearly uh, it, it, it eluded us. Um, focus groups were not possible because of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and they're a kind of artificial environment for, uh, um, for the kind of naturalistic responses that we were looking for anyway. And neither of us had the stomach for the, the IRB implications of installing cameras in people's living rooms. So what we ultimately hit on was the idea of an audio diary app, an app that people could use to verbally record their impressions of each new episode. And we recruited in the Facebook group for participants. And what you can see here on the right hand side of the screen is a screenshot of the app that we created. Um, so you'll see the background there is a uh, characteristic uh, Jerusalem stone. And uh, on the top, you've got the word uh, Stiesel um, in Hebrew characters. There are buttons to press um, to press play and pause and submit. And then in the middle, you've got a, um, a box that says prompt question. And what we asked people to do was just to just to tell us right about about everything that they um, that they noticed after each new episode, um, what they had, what it had made them think about, what they had wondered about um, and um, their reactions, um, good, bad or, or, or in between. Right, what we really asked people to do was just to just to speak out loud and to tell us everything that they were thinking and feeling. Now, the volume of data that we collected using this app surpassed anything, quite frankly, that we could ever have imagined. So in the first week that Series 3 came to Netflix, we collected over 300 audio diaries from viewers across the world. And we currently have 580 diaries from over 200 participants. And for the remainder of this talk, I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we discovered in these diaries, and particularly what they tell us about what people learn from watching Stiesel. So the first observation that I would like to share is that we discovered that one of the, the main reasons, actually, that viewers are drawn to Stiesel is because of the languages in which it's filmed, the languages of Yiddish and Hebrew. Now, language was a really critical site of learning and engagement in the show because we noticed that our diarists really pay close attention to the Yiddish and the Hebrew being spoken by the characters. Now, most of our diarists wouldn't and didn't describe themselves as fluent in, in either of these languages, but many had some level of comprehension of one or both of them. And they clearly, they, they clearly listened very, very carefully to the expressions that were repeated um, by characters. And they, they really tried to understand what they meant and how they were used. So they also paid a lot of attention to the subtitles and to the differences between how the subtitles translated the dialogue and how they thought that words should be translated themselves. So you'll see the mug on the screen here, which can be yours for $13.95 on Cafe Press. Um, and the shh on the mug there is a request for other people to please stay quiet so the viewer can uh, watch the show and also read the subtitles as well. So shh, I'm trying to translate Stiesel. Now, we found that the interest in the linguistic dimension of Stiesel um, really transcended the Jewish community. So among our diarists, we found that Stiesel amassed a surprisingly large following among native German speakers, um, and they were really fascinated by Yiddish as a dialect form of their own language. So as one of our German speaking diarists told us, she found it really annoying when the characters um, switched to speaking in Hebrew because she liked to knit as she, as she watched television. And every time that the, the character switched to Hebrew, she had to look up and look at the subtitles. Whereas when they were speaking in Yiddish, there was enough commonalities with German that she didn't have to look up at the screen. So as well as trying to translate the dialogue to understand what the words meant, something else that we noticed in our diaries was that our participants did a lot of wondering out loud about the linguistic dimensions of Yiddish and Hebrew languages. So they noticed and they also asked a lot of questions about the linguistic characteristics of these languages, such as their, their intonation and pronunciation and stress. So the quote on the screen that you see here is a very representative one. It's one that we heard from a lot of diarists. And it speaks to the way that the, the diarists, as they watched the show, they started to notice the different intonations in, in Hebrew and Yiddish 
And they thought out loud about how these languages might be similar, right? And, and how they might have evolved. So this diary said, and I quote, it's so interesting how some of the Hebrew that the ultra-Orthodox speak has a different intonation, almost like a Yiddish intonation, but it's Hebrew words. It's so interesting. And I wonder where that comes from. So what we can, uh, we can tell here is that this diarist has some knowledge of modern spoken Hebrew and modern spoken Hebrew um, follows um, typically a, a Sephardi style of, of intonation um, in how words are pronounced. But what she noticed was that the characters on the screen didn't follow that convention. They tended to pronounce Hebrew words using an Ashkenazi inflection. So an example of that that some of you here might be familiar with uh, tonight, for example, is the word Shabbat, right? When pronounced with a Sephardic pronunciation, and um, we have that T sound at the end, Shabbat, with a more Yiddish or Ashkenazi inflection, um, it would be Shabbos with an S on the end, right? So as this diarist watched the show, um, she really started to, to wonder and to think aloud about um, how those two different um, intonation and pronunciation styles came about and how they might have evolved. Something else that we noticed when our audio diarists talked about the languages used in Stiesel was the presence of language ideologies. Now, language ideologies are the explicit and also implicit beliefs that people have about languages and their speakers. So scholarship shows us that language ideologies are really critical to the ways that people um, identify themselves through language and also um, how they relate to the languages of others. And language ideologies were very, very present in our audio diaries. So let's take a look at this first quote here on the screen. And here our diarist says, I'm just so taken in by the beauty of the Yiddish language and the amazing wording, the old fashioned sayings. Those just go deep to my heart as a Yiddish speaker. That Hamish, homey feeling. I think it's something I, I don't really experience with other movies or series that are about Jewish families or Israeli life. And I think that old fashioned quality is something that speaks to me personally as well. So we see here that this diarist attributes a sense of, of beauty and a homely feeling to, to Yiddish. That's the language ideology that she associates with it. And for her, that makes the characters and the Stiesel storyline feel, feel very familiar and comfortable as she perceives it. Now, what's important to us here is not the question of whether Yiddish really is old fashioned as she claims it to be. Actually, we could have a pretty lively debate about that. But what is important that that's how, is that, that how this, that's how this person hears the Yiddish. Um, and through those, those associations, she builds an affective connection with the show and the characters that really speak to her in a personal way. And in the second quote uh, here on the screen uh, from another diarist, you'll see that this nostalgia, right, for this, this homey or Hamish feeling of the Yiddish language, um, has become even more aspirational with the commitment to uh, start the new Yiddish program on Duolingo, which, as we know, was a popular pandemic uh, pursuit for lots of people. And as this diarist says, she said, I, I understood a bit of the Hebrew, from my, for, of the Yiddish, sorry, from my grandparents and from watching this. I speak Hebrew. I understand a little bit of German and I, I want to know more about it, more about Yiddish. And I want to start with the new Duolingo app, which has gotten Yiddish as a language. Now, we don't know ultimately whether she followed through and how long she stayed with the Yiddish uh, program on Duolingo, um, it's a program that lots of people started but didn't necessarily follow through on, um, but she certainly aspired to it as a result of watching Stiesel. And the final observation that I would like to, to make about language and learning um, in the context of Stiesel is that we notice that one of the ways that participants in our diary project learned about language from Stiesel was by trying to physically articulate or in the context of the Facebook group, uh, write the words that the characters use. So I'm going to play for you now a short anonymous audio clip from one of our diarists. And in this clip, a viewer is noticing that the family, the, the Stiesel family have two sinks. Um, that's in keeping with the practice of cash root. Right? So one sink is for meat dishes and the other sink is for dairy dishes. And this clip is a really prime example of a participant trying out new vocabulary and trying to get her vocal apparatus to pronounce a new word. So here we go. And at the kitchen with the two sinks, um, strict division so that 
you can eat kosher. Actually, I don't really, I don't even think kosher uh, takes up a huge part of the series. I don't know if I pronounce it right, kosher, kosher. So in doing the research for this project, even though we hadn't originally imagined that we would be creating a new app for audio diaries, it ultimately ended up offering some considerable advantages because it encouraged participants to, to try sounding out new words and using them in a, in a sentence appropriately. And the fact that they wanted to do that showed us a lot because, of course, pronouncing new words is a form of, of learning in and of itself. And I want to note that the diarist um, featured here was a native uh, German speaker, and she identified as, as, as non-Jewish, she was Christian. Um, so you see here somebody trying to learn to pronounce a word that they might have had um, relatively few opportunities to use in, in everyday life, um, all because of a TV show. Now to move on to some other forms of learning outside of the topic of language. Now, other forms of learning about other topics um, in our audio diaries frequently came in the form of observations, suppositions, and questions. So our diarists asked a lot of questions. They asked about why ultra-Orthodox Jews dressed as they did, why they ate certain foods, why husbands and wives typically sleep in separate beds, um, and about how they prayed as well. They were really interested too about divisions between Jews and non-Jews, as well as between different kinds of Jews in Israel. Now, by using the diary app, we were able to capture people's thoughts and streams of consciousness. So a lot of this question asking came from people simply wondering out loud. They asked a lot of rhetorical questions of themselves and they compared the situations that they saw represented on the screen to other life experiences that they had had and tried to work out the answers to their questions. And all this in and of itself is, is a form of learning. So check out this clip. It's from a participant in the US who self-identified as Hindu. And in this clip, she's noticing that the men in the series characteristically smoke and drink alcohol. Um, and I just want to note that there's, there's no prohibition on those things in Judaism. Um, so here's what she has to say about it. Um, one big thing that I noticed was there's a lot of drinking alcohol and smoking. I mean, not just in this episode, it's been, you know, since the beginning, but it was this episode where we saw Kive getting drunk at the restaurant um, and it just kind of, it was just so flagrant and it got me thinking whether, you know, these practices are allowed in the religion, in the Jewish religion. Um, for example, in Islam, there's an actual prohibition on drinking and smoking. In Hinduism, for example, there's perhaps no formal prohibition, but the most practicing or devout of Hindus would never be drinking and smoking like that. So it's kind of it's kind of weird to see. Um, if they were just ordinary Jews, that's one thing, but the fact that there were ultra Orthodox Jews, it was um, it, it was uh, it was strange, put it that way. So in this clip, we see that our diarist is confronting the fact that a tradition that is presented in the series as, as being restrictive because of its religious beliefs is actually more permissive on the issues of smoking and alcohol than other religious traditions that she's, that she's familiar with. And for her, this is something of a paradox that, as she labels it, is, is strange. And ultimately, it leads her to think somewhat negatively about ultra-Orthodox Jews because, as she sees it, they participate in characteristically non-religious behavior, despite appearing to be very religious. For her, this is really paradoxical. Now, frequently in some of these streams of consciousness, we heard diarists expressing their judgment of ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Now, I want to note that when we conducted interviews, when we did Zoom interviews with different members of the Facebook group, we rarely heard interviewees express their judgments of ultra-Orthodoxy with quite the level of, of vitriol that we heard on the app. And now we attribute this again to the affordances of the app, 
where there was no direct interlocutor, there was no interviewer. And so participants may have felt more free to express their unbridled judgments of a tradition that certainly has its restrictive dimensions. So check out this diarist. This diarist uh, self-identified as a non-religious or cultural Jew um, from New York. And here's what she had to say. Well, misogyny has come home to roost in this little community. I have many feelings uh, in this episode. Once again, the producers are very good at making you feel sympathetic for the humanity of these characters. But you can also see how the community itself can only function at the lowest possible level because people can't get out of their own way. They can't create, they can't do anything new. They can't suggest things to each other. They're in tremendous webs of deception about which family is doing what and who is living best to the so-called rules of, of that society. And uh, I know it was played for humor. I know it was supposed to be funny, but I'm so annoyed at how impressed everybody is that uh, I didn't find it too funny. So as we see in this clip, the learning that can occur when people engage in, in cultural art sites like, like television well, we shouldn't assume that it always results in increased multicultural tolerance and understanding. So for this diarist, Stiesel only seemed to confirm the prejudices that as a secular Jew, she already held against the ultra-Orthodox. More than that even, it attached images to them, names and personae. And when she became invested in the characters, she only became more frustrated with the religious restrictions that, in, in her view, they imposed upon their lives. Now, other diarists, on the other hand, talked extensively about how their investment in the characters wasn't a source of, of frustration, but rather made them really love the show. And because the themes of the show and the personalities of the characters really resonated with, with these diarists, they became really invested in them and their lives. So as one participant in our diary project who identified as Catholic shared in her diary entry, and this is for the first episode of series three, uh, she said, and this is the first quote on the screen. She said, I've been anticipating this season so much because I feel so connected to the characters. It was just so wonderful to see them all again and to see their neighborhood in Jerusalem. So diaries like this one, frequently commentated on how relatable they found the characters and how they could empathize with their various joys and struggles and how they were comparable to their own lives. So we see too that in the second quote here on the screen, another diary participant, and this participant was a modern Orthodox Jewish woman from New Jersey. She said, what draws me into the series is that the Haredi ultra-Orthodox Jews of that area of Jerusalem, they have their, their rules that they follow, their strict letter of the law kind of observance, but yet they experience everything that other people do. I think what's so beautiful about this series is that we can look into this very specific Jewish group, yet we see that they struggle with a lot of the same struggles as many other people do. Now, these two diarists, uh, the ones that I just quoted, were clearly enamored with the universal resonance of, of the characters. And as we saw earlier, it was that universal resonance that, that Abihai were really hoping would, would come out of Stiesel, right? That's what they made sure was really kind of front and center of the portrayal of ultra-Orthodox Judaism represented by the Stiesel family. And there's no question that it was those universal themes, that affective resonance of the characters, their relatability to a worldwide audience of Jewish and also non-Jewish viewers. Well, that's ultimately one of, if not the element that has made the show so successful. But to a certain extent, these universal themes are ironically also what makes the show a little bit unbelievable. Right, because these, these storylines that resonate with a global audience, like love and artistic struggle and the pursuit of individual happiness, well, they unfold in a world that for the most part doesn't actually subscribe to these values. 
right? So these universal values are, are imposed onto the Stiesel family to make their otherwise translatable lives capable of being transfigured into a, a global idiom. And in our diary project, we found that diarists who had a bit more personal experience of ultra-Orthodox Jews, well, they noticed this, right? They noticed that the universal elements of, uh, of these characters were being emphasized at the expense of their particularity. And they observed that at times it made Stiesel a little more than a shallow soap opera because it left aside the aspects of ultra-Orthodox life that, that in reality, give this community the most conspicuous aspects of its communal identity. So as one of our interviewees, who was a secular Jewish man from New Jersey told us, and here I'm quoting on the screen, he said, something I've said on the Stiesel page on the Facebook group a few times is that it's just a family drama. You never see any of those beautiful aspects of ultra-Orthodox Judaism the huge number of friendships they have. You never see a beautiful wedding. You never see Passover or you never see Shavuot, two Jewish holidays. You, you don't see any good things about Orthodox Judaism. Now, as I said, this, this diarist came to Stiesel with some insights uh, into Orthodoxy. He lived in Northern New Jersey and he lived pretty close to communities of ultra-Orthodox Jews. He had no personal connections to those communities, and that really um, did motivate his interest in Stiesel, because he found them really fascinating, right? And he had made something of a hobby of, of Haredi tourism and telling us that he had he'd been to Borough Park, he'd, he'd been to Crown Heights, and, and also to Kiryas Yol. And those are all communities um, with uh, large communities of ultra-Orthodox Jews. Now, indeed, many of the diarists who were attracted to Stiesel and indeed to our diary project came to this because they really did share his fascination with, with all things ultra-Orthodox. And when we spoke to members of the Facebook group, many of them told us that the reason that they were drawn to Stiesel was that they often see ultra-Orthodox people in their local communities, but they had few opportunities to engage with them. And they really wanted to know more about who they were and find out more about their lives. And they were attracted particularly to Stiesel because unlike other narratives that really emphasize the, the deficiencies of the community, right, for the, the purpose of that enlightenment narrative of the, of the disenchanted individual seeking personal liberation and freedom, the kinds of narratives that, that really do uh, underscore series like Unorthodox, for example, well, they were drawn to Stiesel because it, it emphasized the inner lives of ultra-Orthodox Jews um, as, as they really lived and, and what really happened behind closed doors. So as one of our interviewees, we'll call her Marie, um, she was a non-religious Christian from London. Um, she, she talked about how she often saw ultra-Orthodox Jews um, in London, and particularly when she took her children on trips to museums. And she said, you know, it's a community that looks so homogenous. But what was great about the show was that it complexified the homogeneity, and it emphasized how its principal characters were, in many ways, really different from one another. Now, the irony of Marie's statement, of course, is that Stiesel actually doesn't illustrate the complexities of an ultra-Orthodox family, because it offers a scripted narrative of a group of actors who, when a, the camera stops rolling, well, the men detach their artificial uh, peyote, their side curls from their heads, and the women swap their modest skirts for jeans. And it was really fascinating to us that members of the Stiesel Let's Talk About It group, and, and uh, particularly those who participate in our diary project, they were so interested in Stiesel as a window for seeing the, the inside realities of an ultra-Orthodox community, that they frequently seemed to forget that Stiesel was a drama and not a documentary. So one of the things that we saw quite often was that um, periodically somebody would post to the Facebook group saying, I'm wondering why we don't see many scenes filmed on Shabbat, right? Why don't we see films served on Shabbat, particularly in synagogues? Why don't we see Shabbat services in synagogues? And what would inevitably happen would, that, would be that somebody would post and they would say and comment on the post and they would say, well, you know what? Actually, there's a prohibition in Orthodox Judaism about using cameras on the Sabbath, which would make it difficult to film in synagogue. And this was a really good, ne good natured attempt at Jewish education, right? A sort of halakha of Shabbat 101, right? A sort of laws of Shabbat 101. And indeed, it was often very informative to group members who came to the show with, 
with little Jewish background, and they were really intrigued to learn about the extensive interpretation of, of prohibitions regarding work on Shabbat and holidays for traditionally observant Jews. But it, it totally elided the fact that the Shtisel family aren't actually ultra-Orthodox, right? They're actors, they're the creation of studio executives and screenwriters, and there was no actual halakhic prohibition for filming scenes on Shabbat um, or in the synagogue. It was, it was just something that the, they chose not to do for, for other actually much more, much more pragmatic reasons. So what I think, and here I'm going to wrap up, um, what I think what we can take away about what we've discovered through this project, about what people learn from watching a show like Stiesel, is that old academic adage that it's complicated. So on the one hand, there was, there was definitely new content knowledge acquisition, right? And particularly we saw this in the domain of language. As a result of watching Stiesel, people learned new words, they learned new pronunciations, and they acquired new understanding of, of linguistic dialects as well. Um, we also saw, and this is going back to that um, insight from Jonas Frickman, right, that there was also affective learning, right, because people related to the characters, um, because they had affective responses to them, they were really drawn into the series and they learned a lot of, a lot of new things along the way. But also we found that affective learning can be really ambivalent. Right. So whereas, whereas Frickman says, you know, whenever there is an affective response to media content, learnings occurring, I think what we can add to that based on our Stiesel data is that the kind of learning that can result from these kinds of experiences isn't necessarily always going to be positive. So where some of the participants in our diary project have at, had affective responses to the show that led them to see really universal values in the Stiesel family, others saw the Stiesel family as confirming the prejudices that they already had about ultra-Orthodox Judaism. For them, the show confirmed that their lives were, were boundaried and gendered and restrictive, right? In short, anti-modern and repressive. And this, of course, leads me to my third observation, which is that cultural context, of course, conditions the way that people consume media. So, for example, for the Hindu diarist who expected religious people to refrain from alcohol, watching Stiesel in which many of the characters drank and smoke, even though there was no issue with those things in Judaism, well, for her, that was really, really jarring because it didn't fit her mold of what a person who took religion seriously should look like. Because, of course, even when we claim to watch a show like Stiesel to learn about a, a new culture or a community that we're, we're not part of, we're still bringing a lot of baggage to the table. And we watch TV including TV about Jews and Judaism, accompanied by all the baggage of our, of our upbringing, of our cultures, our prejudices and our presuppositions, even, and perhaps especially when, we claim that we're doing it to expand our cultural knowledge. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you all so much for, for coming and look forward to any questions that you might have. All right, so I see this, there's a message in the chat yet there to say, uh, please use the chat to ask questions um, or use the raise hand function. Um, so I I'm saw seeing... Kirsten for Maglish's hand up first and then a, Annette Wayne checks. I, I, think, I think Kirsten was doing a very kind round of applause. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so I think that Annette is first. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering um, to what extent the fact that all of the characters are actually not Orthodox um, uh, gave an overlay to the series that would not have been there had theoretically, hypothetically, the actors actually have been mm -hmm. Haredi. Uh, so it is, uh, just thinking about that as you're talking about what the diarist said, this isn't really the genius of Stissel was it really wasn't a peek at ultra-Orthodox life. Uh, a few prayers, a few blessings before eating, a kissing of the mezuzah, uh, the language, of course, but that 
but it was uh, secular people playing orthodox people that I think smoothed out uh, what otherwise might have been, well, probably not done, but would have had a totally different tone. Yeah, so what Annette is referring to there is the fact that um, most of the, the actors uh, who uh, who were featured in Shtisa were not themselves ultra-Orthodox. I don't think any of them actually identified as, as ultra-Orthodox, although one of the creators was uh, was was formerly a Haredi. He grew up in a Haredi uh, community. And um, I think we can compare it, it. What might be illustrative in this regard is to compare it to another movie um, which does uh, depict ultra-Orthodox Judaism in a very sympathetic light, and in which the two principal characters are in fact portrayed by, um, by, by actors who are themselves Orthodox, and that's Ushpizin, the, the movie Ushpizin, um, which comes from, which uh, I think it's 2003, although don't quote me on that, it's, it's a fair bit older. And I think one of the differences that you see between those two productions, right, is that, um, is that Ushpizin is a little kind of rough around the edges. Right, like it's um, it's not quite so polished. One of the things that's really noticeable about Stiesel is that it's it's really polished, and the actors are really attractive. Right, that's one of the things that I think kind of draws you into some of their storylines is that particularly the principal characters are played by actors who are, as we say, very easy on the eye. Right, <laughs> so I think that is um, that's one of the very clear. Um, uh, uh, ramifications, right, of, of using of, of using secular actors is, is that it had this um, it, a sort of glossy, you know, higher production value look to it, right? Whereas when you compare it to Ushpizin, right, it comes from a, an era of Israeli filmmaking that was a little bit lower budget too, right? It wasn't quite so, it's a lovely story, it's a lovely movie, but it definitely has a more kind of lower lower budget feel. We might also think of other um, Israeli series like Shrugin, right, which also uh, represent um, uh, this time modern Orthodox Jews, but have that more kind of low budget feel. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that is, that's one of the things that was afforded, right, by using, uh, by using secular actors was that you had this very polished, very kind of aesthetically refined look and feel to the series that really drew you in. Uh, I think that Nigel has his hand raised. Hi. Uh, well, thank you for a really very nice overview. And I was something I was struck by <clears throat> that I thought was a little bit unique to me was this fascination by language, in, in, with language, and the switch between uh, modern Hebrew and Yiddish, and who uses Yiddish and who uses Hebrew. And in fact, the Ashkenazi pronunciation, like Shabbos, is reserved largely for religious texts or phrases, but in their ordinary day-to-day, -day, they use very modern Hebrew. And uh, I just kept hearing, I lived in Israel as a child uh, and among Orthodox, not so much ultra-Orthodox, but with some connections to the ultra-Orthodox. And old words would come back every once in a while, and it would just amaze me, like the, like the referring, one of the, the elderly Rebbitson, who is a friend of Stissel's mother in the nursing home, and when she, when Stissel's mother links up to a, a, a North African guy who speaks her Arabic when she speaks to him in Yiddish, she refers to him as, as, as uh, Frankim, Frankim. This is really French speakers. And that just clicked years ago, hearing Ashkenazis refer to the North African, the North African co religionists as Frankim. And, and there was time and again, there was some little hint of language that, I, or, or even, or, or sometimes like, it was very authentic, like the twirling of the hat by, or, or perhaps the twirling of the pace. A lot of that was really, really skilled and authentic from my experience. It was, so it was wonderful to see. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Yeah, I, I think that um, one of the reasons that we heard so much about language in the, in the diaries was that I think for a lot of people, it, it did, it's, it did awaken latent knowledge, latent vocabulary, right? That was just lying somewhat dormant. And then you and then you hear it, particularly with some familiar associations, and it it comes to life. In in one sense, I think it was just it's the most overt mode of learning because it's so easy to say, Oh, I remember that word, I remember that pronunciation. 
So one of the things that I would comment, just uh, Nigel, you brought up the, the feeling of realism, right, both with the language and, and, and the little gestures, like the, the curling of the, uh, the twirling of the hat, for example, um, is that the filming of the series, um, some of you might know, was done somewhat stealthily, so all of the external shots. Right, so the internal shots, a lot of them were filmed in, in apartments and um, they're very kind of realistic, sort of somewhat shabby looking apartments. But the, the external scenes, the scenes in the streets were actually filmed um, in an ultra orthodox neighborhood in Jerusalem. And they first uh, began filming quite, quite obviously, quite overtly. But then they ran into trouble when they were filming one of their, their first scenes. A, a woman was applying makeup to the face of a male actor, um, right, which is a very normal thing to happen on a film set. And, and they were run out of the neighborhood um, because this, of course, was, was a real contravention of all sorts of, all sorts of things, of, of, uh, assumption around gender and, and touch and shaman and all sorts of things for, for that community. And so after that, all of their external scenes were, were filmed sort of guerrilla style, like through windows and the, the directors would be kind of hiding in buildings and through filming through the window and giving the actors instructions in, in earpieces. So I think there was a lot that happened behind the scenes to really give it that authentic feel. One other very small thing that I'll, I'll note is that if you look really closely at the men, you will see that the payas, the peyote, their forelocks, right, are, are not tightly kind of curled, right? They have like a longer, um, they have like a, a longer appearance to them. They're not quite so, so tightly curled. And that was to show <clears throat> that the Stiesel family had, had been in Israel since like the 19th century. It's a very characteristic style of wearing payas um, for these sort of old Jerusalem um, Haredi Jews. Um, and particularly for the neighborhood that they lived in, Geula, right, which is next to Meir Sharim, but it's it's not Meir Sharim. Right? Meir Sharim is, is a little bit um, even more, we might say, um, extreme um, in some of its interpretation of Jewish law than, uh, than Geula. So they they um, they had all these little nods that if you, um, to use the, the Talmudic expression, hamavin yavin, if you knew, you knew. Right. And and only if you know, would you know that um, it wasn't just the fact that they were wearing side locks, the pay up the curls, but the way that they were curled even told you a lot about the family, too. So I'm seeing uh, Yael and Trista have hands raised. Um, Michael and Elaine, you're unmuted. Did you have a question you want to ask first? Oh, I'm unmuted. Um, Yes, thank you for this. This was excellent, just to, to get into such uh, intellectual ways of looking at Stissel. First, pronouncing his name is hard, Stissel. Anyway, uh, quickly, I felt that it was very now in the sense that they were very human. And the fact that they lived in this um, community of their own is, oh, well, it didn't, it didn't cause any problem in itself, but problems of life became their problems. But I was very curious if, how did the Israeli uh, community take it? Did they do focus groups in, in, in different neighborhoods and so on just to get the opinions? Yeah, I don't know if they've done, they've done focus groups, but there certainly have been some studies of, of whether it really did change opinions of and um, perceptions of, of ultra-Orthodox Jews and affect a, a rapprochement between secular Israelis and, and religious Israelis? And the short answer is no, it didn't. Like, it's it's just a TV show. And, and some of the mm -hmm. things that divide those two communities are, are bigger than even, you know, seeing a, a relatable, um, you know, Michael Aloni, um, Kim, uh, who plays the main character of, of Akiva, um, could, could really hope to, um, to affect. Um, but one thing I will note that is really, really interesting and does, I think, speak to the fact that the show has certainly had a cultural impact in Israel is that the music for the, for the show, and I know that that's a particular interest of, of yours, Elaine, but the music for the show has become really popular at, um, at celebrations, at simchas, at smachot, like, like weddings, bar and bat mitzvahs, not mm. only among secular Jews, but also at ultra orthodox uh, Jewish uh, simcha celebrations as well. Now that's really, really interesting because it shows us that ultra orthodox Jews are watching the show, 
the fact that the, the music has become, you know, part of the musical repertoire of, of ultra-Orthodox Jews. And that's really interesting to us because most ultra-Orthodox Jews don't own a television. They don't have television. They really establish pretty strict boundaries when it comes to, to media and, and technology and, and uh, how much exposure they have to, to popular culture. But one of the things that we saw, and we even saw this on the Facebook group, there were members of the Facebook group who are themselves ultra-Orthodox and they came on sort of incognito and they talked about the ways that they surreptitiously watched the show. So there were different um, sort of uh, streaming like networks, like underground streaming networks that people would share episodes on like a, a data stick, a thumb drive um, between each other because they weren't they didn't have television, so they weren't subscribing to, to Yes, which is the Israeli channel that, that streamed the show. But of course, there are always ways to, to find uh, to find the show. And it had become it became like this, this sort of ubiquitous part of, of, um, of, of ultra is uh, orthodox popular culture. So you're like, okay, have you got the latest episode of Shtisel? Um, so the fact that the music is, is showing up um, was really interesting. And to a certain extent, it's maybe even more interesting to note that the ultra orthodox were watching themselves being represented represented on the screen um, yes. than, than the secular Israelis. <laughs> is there any way of knowing whether the non uh, non Jews were interested in the program or, or followed it? Yeah, so we had a lot of non-Jewish participants in our project. Um, we had a lot of non-Jewish um, people who signed up to record diaries for us and who are members of, of the Facebook group. There's enormous interest. I, I think we can attribute that interest to a number of different things. I think because of the situation of the pandemic, right, more people are just exploring new things, exploring new cultures and exploring it through media like television. Whereas absent of the context of the pandemic, we might hop on a plane and go and explore a new culture uh, culture and a, a new country. Of course, we, we can't do that right now, can't do that uh, in ways that we might all feel safe to do so. And so uh, media, right? Television, films, music, the arts become a way of exploring new cultures in ways that um, maybe before we might have, have been able to more um, readily access in-person experiences. So that's one reason. Um, secondly, I think just the, the, um, the long-standing interest in, in closed communities, right? Like not only is, is Shtisol uh, an unorthodox popular amongst members who, people who are not members of those communities, but also programs about funda fundamentalist Mormons, about the Amish, right? The, there's something about the the seeing inside close communities that is just um, endemically fascinating. And then I think we just also, um, we saw a lot amongst our diary projects that people just had their own idiosyncratic reasons for coming to the show. So um, somebody who was a German speaker, right? we had a lot of German speakers um, who were interested in the show because of, of Yiddish. Um, and so uh, they saw Yiddish as a dialect version of their own language. And so that brought them to it. We had people telling us that you know they'd visited Israel and so they were just interested in any shows that went to Israel or uh, a friend, an Israeli friend, a Jewish friend had, had recommended it. So um, we had a lot of just idiosyncratic reasons that, that people were, were interested, but definitely a lot of, of non-Jewish interest in it for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Trista, please. Hi, thank you. Um, so first of all, um, this kind of goes really far back into the like beginning of the presentation with uh, the synthetic experience. Uh, I was actually going to ask if you could possibly go back to the slide because I was trying to jot down like the entire quote. Um, but my question was, is uh, with the idea of the synthetic experience, do you think non-Jewish watchers will take uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it. Uh, Stiesel with as an accurate source of ultra orthodox life without like more research into the topic. Because yeah. uh, when I was searching how to pronounce it, the first thing that came up with was um, someone saying that they do not think it is an accurate representation of the life. Yes. So it's what, if you Google Stiesel, one of the first things that, that comes up is, um, is an, an op-ed, an article from somebody who is, who are the, who is themselves uh, orthodox um, saying, you know, they don't feel like it's, it's accurate. Um, yeah. 
And, and yes, we, we definitely saw a lot of evidence of that in our research, both from our diaries and also on the Facebook group that, that people got Stiesel confused for a documentary, right? They, they really thought that this was an authoritative um, source, even to the extent that sometimes they, um, they forgot that it, it, it was not, it was just, it was a scripted drama. Um, and and I think that's true. And I, I think to a certain extent, we all we all do that. We all have those synthetic experiences um, from our from our consumption of media that, that we that we take into our everyday life. And, and this was the, the, the argument of the, the two theorists I mentioned. It's just that sometimes they're more overt than others. Right. So at times our experience of different uh, communities and cultures and media, the synthetic experiences that gives us might be a more kind of implicit right, understanding of, of how we of how we uh, frame other cultures and communities. And at times it might be more um, explicit as well. But what's really interesting, I think, and one of the things that we really saw from this data is that because of the Internet, because of social media, people know that there are actually other sources of knowledge. And so, as I mentioned, this, this group, it's just, it's just huge. It's 33,000 members, right? If we had 33,000 following on the Sterling Institute um, Facebook group, we would be doing very, very well. If we had the frequency of posts that we got in the Stiesel group as well, we'd, we'd be doing very, very well. This is a very, very lively group. And people did take to social media with their questions, right? They came a lot to say, okay, this thing I saw in Stiesel, like, is this real? And, and people really piled on with their opinions. So I think one thing I might take away from this research is that whilst, yes, people are going to at times confuse um, media um, for, for reality and sometimes um, the, what they take away is going to be sort of a more implicit conditioning and sometimes it will be more explicit with just the world in which we live, the technological world in which in which we live, TV is is no longer viewed in isolation, right? And I, I think it's very it's very common and certainly something that we saw in this in this research that people would watch Stiesel or watch the Facebook group with their phone in hand, ready to Google and to to look something up. So I, I think in in many ways, um, whilst the show was treated as a source of knowledge, there was also recognition that it's not the only source of knowledge available to people. Thank you. That that was just, I don't know, that was just something that kind of interesting because um I find I am really into period pieces and I have to counter myself like this is not um this is not 100 percent accurate just because it's you know made now and not then or but yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think that um, Yael yeah, still has her hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I loved your analysis, Laura, and I have just a, a couple questions. One is, um, could one kind of lens through which to look at this um, could be that there's kind of was the shift in Israel from kind of demanding grading assimilation among um, different members of the society towards a relatively greater embrace of multiculturalism. So you see this like with Smugim and Schlitzel, like you say, but also with like Arab labor that we've shown at MSU and we're going to be showing Muna and bringing in Mira Wad. And so you get these um, mini series that focus on different subcultures and different communities in Israel. And part of it, you know, some of them still, there's not an, as much integration. So it's kind of looking at kind of a different community in your society. So is that kind of one lens of what's going on, not just with the Orthodox and ultra Orthodox, but other communities. And then secondly, um, I was kind of curious, you know, to what extent you saw in kind of people's observations and in your own analysis that you see kind of the ultra Orthodox community, but you also see kind of attempts at um, pushing the bound, the, the acceptable um, margins of ultra orthodox society and instances in which you have that and you know it's been a while i saw all three episodes but it's a little while so i saw it and some things become a blur so i don't know if it was you know the artist or or kind of being you know starting to date a a, a more secular woman or a divorce or i forget whether i'm mixing up shows now or, or someone who was trying to dance and um in a in a dance um uh, and so i don't know i don't know if i have all my examples straight but i think through watching it you had a sense of as the ultra orthodox community in Israel is growing and many more are working and kind of that 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 former line um, 
is being tested and expanded perhaps um, as to what's acceptable in the society, um, whether you saw observations of that or what you're thinking of that was through through your analysis of Stitzel? Yeah, thank you for those, those great questions. Um, so to your first point, yes, I think absolutely, right? We're seeing much more multicultural representation in Israeli uh, Israeli media, and that doesn't just extend to, to Jews, right? So Arab labor is a really, uh, really good example there. The other thing I would say is that we're seeing um, increasing diversity in the creatives who are producing these television, right? So it's not it's not just that these things magically appeared on the screen, but the, the kinds of people who are coming into the industries of, of media production, right? So someone like Jonathan Indersky, right, who grows who grew up Haredi and, and was able to find his his way um, into, into, into media, into script writing, right? The very um, the the opportunities of access, right, to people of diverse backgrounds. Right is is also what leads to the production of, of these more diverse forms of media representation. Right, um, I think one of the reasons that Stiesel is is so good is because of Indersky and and what he's able to bring to the script. So to your second question about how with with the um, the greater or more visible presence of ultra orthodox Jews in Israeli society, to what extent do we see do we see limits um, or sort of boundaries emerging or um, tensions? I would say that one, um, one of the things that we saw really prominently in the diaries that people submitted when they watched the third series, the most recent series of, of Stiesel, was um, very, very strong reactions to two themes that are featured in the third series. Now, if, if you haven't seen the third series, I'm gonna try and not give too much away, but there is a plot line about one of the characters who is having trouble getting pregnant and she explores various options. They consult a rabbi, explore surrogacy, and, and ultimately one of the issues is that the, um, the, the character cannot go, um, is, is it being advised not to go forward with a dangerous pregnancy because of the issue of Bekuach Nefesh, right? Because the life of, of the mother in this situation has to come first. So we had that storyline. And then we had another storyline about a, a character, an ultra-Orthodox character um, who experienced bipolar disorder, right? So that was, that was part of, of who she was. And in the audio diaries, we saw just immense sympathy for that former storyline. So many diaries saying, I had no idea, particularly from non-Jews. Non-Jews were so intrigued to see that in the, in the case of, of Judaism and Jewish law, the life of mother of the mother is prioritized over the life of the, of the fetus, right? Um, the, the health and the life of the mother comes, uh, comes first. And that was really revelatory to a lot of the non-Jewish diary participants, but in particular, just the, the sensitive way in which this, this storyline was explored and, and the fact that you would have a rabbi who would be invested in this young couple and their struggles to have a, to have a baby. And that was, that was seen as something that was very sensitive. And so sort of seeing inside this, this dimension of ultra-Orthodox life, right? We saw a lot of responses saying, wow, like I really felt for this couple. I really feel like I know more and I want to know more. This is wonderful. Now, with the second storyline, um, the storyline about the character who experienced bipolar disorder, there we saw very, very strongly negative reactions because the responses to that character from other characters, right, within the fictional narrative of the show was that um, there was a lot of opposition to her. There was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of, of negative responses to the fact that she experienced mental illness. And so we saw a lot of, of, of pushback there saying, you know, this, this community, they're so limited. This is what happens when you, you don't understand science and embrace science and, you know, the realities of, of, of mental health, right? So I, I think what that points to is the fact that, um, uh, that uh, 
positive or negative appraisal of, of Haredim, right, isn't a um, isn't a holistic issue. But but what we saw was was that could have came forward on like a case by case basis, right? So in the case of, for example, these issues around around pregnancy, say, like, wow, this community is so sensitive. This is so wonderful. You know, flip to the issue of mental illness. Oh my gosh, this community is so awful and so harsh and. Um, so that was uh, that is, that's one anecdote that I would share in response to, to that to that question. Um, I think Annette has a question. Unmute. Uh, did anyone have well known that ultra orthodox Jews in Israel typically do not they're exempted from army service or whether people just just didn't know it. Um, so that wasn't mentioned explicitly, but there are some points in the plot line where the characters very representatively say really negative things right about 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 the state right and so there's a storyline in, in series three where Akiva kind of runs up against the bureaucracy of the of the state, and one of the things that his father. Um, says one of his expressions uh, through this is he talks a lot about the evil Zionists, right? The, the bureaucrats are the evil Zionists. And then there's a plot line where his, his the brother of, of the patriarch uh, who lives in um, who lives in Antwerp, um, he talks a lot about how he doesn't want to live in Israel because he doesn't want his kids to become Zionists, right? And so those 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 themes, the themes of you know, the exemption from army service, the tensions between ultra orthodox Jews and secular Jews in modern Israel, I would say those are the sort of like classic loggerhead issues between um, between secular and, and religious Jews and the issues that I think this show was was trying to overcome and so didn't um, didn't jump into them directly. But also they didn't sugarcoat them, right? They didn't try to pretend that everything was, was harmonious. And so we did see a lot of a lot of people picked up on the fact that that Shulam, the patriarch of the family, quite often used the term evil Zionists. And that that was something that that, you know, coming from a of an obviously sort of Jewish person um, felt for, for a lot of viewers that was a very strange thing to, to see and a very disturbing thing and a troubling thing. And for others who are maybe a little bit more familiar with some of those um, larger uh, sources of division between Israeli and, and religious Jews, maybe not quite so surprising, but, but still shocking to hear up front. All right. Well, I think we have hit 8.30. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you so much for a stimulating talk and a stimulating discussion. Thanks for everyone joining us. I don't know if we can all <laughs> uh, clap. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you. I'm sure many of viewers have seen Stitzel, and after this will want to, others of you who haven't will want to go see it and, and through uh, Laura's lenses for, for you to be looking at it or, or rewatch some of it. So wonderful, hope to see some of you can make it on Friday and, um, and others on the 26th. Thank you so much.